Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, thank you to the Systematics Association for this uh, invitation. I'm extremely honored to give this talk. Um, uh, also, thank you for the Linnaean Society for hosting this lecture. Um, so, uh, as uh, Elizabeth said, the title of my talk is Fungi in the Ocean's Deep. Um, but before I, I get into fungi, I want to talk about the, the gentleman that this lecture is named after, and that's, uh, uh, I feel like we're on first name terms now, so I'm going to call him Sir Julian. And um, uh, he spent his early years at university studying protistology, which is something, of course, I approve of. Um, he also spent some time in Naples Marine Biology Station studying sea urchins, and we're going to come back to the Naples Marine Biology Station shortly. Um, he rose to prominence in uh, 1929 when he wrote the Sciences of Life book with H.G. Wells. Uh, in 1930s, he was extremely active in setting up the uh, African conservation parks. He then went on to make an Oscar-winning film called The Life of the Life of the Gannets in 1934. He was a secretary of the Zoological Society of London uh, from the mid-30s to um, early uh, 1940s. And then he became the first director general of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organizations. Uh, so at this point, I'm reading this on Wikipedia, thinking I probably should try and do a pretty good job, because uh, this guy... Uh, you know, had some form, and uh, uh, so then uh, I read on, and he, he, in the 40s, he was one of the main figures in the modern evolutionary synthesis, so he was a, a renowned as kind of a commentator, a writer, and a reviewer, and his books, um, he wrote this book called Evolution, the Modern Synthesis in 1942, and it was... Um, Extremely well re uh, received, uh, and I'll just read you a brief extract from a review. Uh, the outstanding evolutionary treaties of the decade, perhaps of the century, the approach is thoroughly scientific, the command of basic information is amazing, and I kind of pray for, uh, for grant reviews like that, but I never get them. Um, he, during this work, he invented terms such as Klein, uh, clades, and grades, and he went on to win a host of medals, including the Linnaean Society's Darwin Wallace Medal and the Darwin Medal from the Royal Society. He was the first president of the British Humanist Association, and with others, he set up the Wildlife uh, WWF, which became the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Later, he became a popular uh, uh, panel show um, guest for the BBC's first quiz show, which was called Animal, Vegetable and Mineral. And um, what, something I really liked about him, in an essay in, uh, in, um, 19, uh, um, in 1961, he wrote an essay called The Crowded World, and he predicted, using principles of compound interest, that the world population would reach 6 billion by 2000. Interestingly, the UN Population Fund marked 12th of Oct October 1999 as the day of 6 million, so he, he was... Not far off, so he, he did quite well. So I'm very honoured to give lecture in his name. Um, uh, the question I really want to get to start with is what defines fungi? What, how do we identify a fungus? And really, I just want to draw your attention to this gentleman. It's the R Reverend Miles J. Berkeley, and it's, uh, this is a digital scan of the portrait at the back of this room. Um, uh, uh, it's Linnaean Society, excellent library. They sent me this digital scan along with uh, details of his life. Uh, he was, um, uh, the reason I want to uh, bring your attention to him is he essentially uh, was the father of mycology in many ways, particularly the father of phytopathology. So that's the study of fungi, uh, fung fungal pathogens of plants. Okay, and the reason uh, I... Uh, we spent a lot of time working, uh, trying to understand the evolution of pa pa fungal pathogenic interactions with plants. Uh, and um, much, much of the study of fungi has been about plant-associated fungi. And he um, uh, was famous because he identified the first plant disease of plants, which is called Phytophthora infestans, which was the causal agent of the great Irish potato famine. Here it is causing disease in a potato leaf, and this is a scanning electron microscope of the, of the parasitic agent. Of course, Miles didn't have scanning electron microscopy, 
But even if he did, uh, he would probably make the conclusion that this is very similar to this organism, which is a true fungus, which causes disease in rice plants. Uh, this is called Magna Porphyria oryzae. It destroys uh, on uh, roughly one third of global rice crops annually. And, he, and basically, even if he had electron microscopy, he would probably come to the conclusion that these guys are evolutionarily related and similar to each other. But actually, um, what turns out is that they are completely unrelated. This is a true fungus, and this is what we call an umycete. It's very distant relative of true fungi. And what I want to get across is that fungal lifestyles evolve virtually multiple times on the tree of life. So here we have a schematic of the tree of life. Over here we have fungi, which branch close to animals. And on the other side of the tree of life, we have these oomycetes that branch close to photosynthetic brown algae, such as this uh, uh, seaweed here or this diatom here. And over here, we have land plants. So what we're dealing with here is kind of a lifestyle of a fungus, a microbial fungus that evolves independently, uh, convergently. Okay. So um, if we can have things that essentially look the same, behave the same, evolve distinctly, separately, on multiple occasions, it kind of really begs the question, what defines the fungi? And uh, I put this review together earlier this year, which was asking the question, you know, what characters can we use to define fungi? And historically, there's been many different characters that people have used to define fungi. These include the, 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 the presence of ergosterol in cell membranes, or the uh, uh, often uh, popular one is the presence of chitin cell wall. Uh, as a kind of developmental structure on the surface of uh, fungal cells. Uh, but actually, when we look in detail, we find that many of these characters, and there's been many of these characters proposed for fungi, are essentially uh, um, absent in many fungal lineages and also present in protists, which are unicellular eukaryote microbes. So what we can tell from this is that actually there is strictly nothing that defines the kingdom fungi. Okay. It's essentially a phylogenetic definition. Okay, so let's change the question slightly and ask a different question, which is, what makes fungi so successful? And along with my uh, long-term collaborator, Nick Tolbert, we have made the case that actually what makes fungi so successful, this is not a defining trait, it's just a characteristic that underpins their ecological success is what we call osmotrophy, and others call osmotrophy. And that's the idea that they feed by secretion of degradative enzymes. So here you have enzymes being packaged up for secretion. They're secreted out of the cell in the extracellular environment. They break down complex molecules into monomers, and these monomers are then transported back into the cell. So this process is what we call osmotrophy. And we, we think this is what makes fungi so successful. And as you can say from, see from this sketch here, that they often do this in a focused area of the cell, uh, which is called the hyphae. So they grow filamentously, they, uh, and, and they grow as they feed, and, this is what, uh, and they focus this osmotrophic function at the tip of the hyphae. Okay. So nearly all fungi are obligate osmotrophs. So where, no matter where we look in the fungal tree of life, from in these important yeasts that we can use to make wine uh, through to these disease, plant diseases that I mentioned uh, earlier, which are both ascomycetes, the branch here, or these are basidiomycete forms here, which form important wood rotting fungi, or again, diseases of plants. No matter where we look, they feed osmotrophically. They use osmotrophy as a function for gaining nutrients. I've also put up some more obscure fungi. These are what we call chytrids, and chytrids is technically a non-formal name. And what it refers to is a fungus that makes a spore with a swimming tail. So they're called zoo spores. Okay? And they uh, form these, again, they form these like, hyphal structures where they interact with material when they feed on it. And here you can see uh, a, a, a zoo sporangium a, uh, of, a, um, of a chytrid growing into pollen. Here we see one growing into a diatom. Another one here, electron microscopy growing into diatoms. And again, uh, this uh, uh, eukaryote algae is covered in fungi growing on the top. And really, our interest in chytrids has become enlivened recently because they've been associated with these mass mortality event, uh, uh, events in frogs. But again, they've all formed these kind of hyphal structures where they grow. And specifically, in this case, they're called rhizoids. They grow invasively into material, digesting complex mo macromolecules into monomers and feeding osmotrophically. Okay. 
So the point I want to make on, uh, uh, the point I want to make at this stage is that actually uh, it's not just that there's a trophy, it's what you see if you look at the fungal tree of life, is you see a consistent pattern of interactions with phototrophs, so photosynthetic organisms such as this plant here. And, they've, and because of this lifestyle, they've been particularly adapted to being mutualists or parasites or saprotrophs um, uh, of fungi. So if you look at the fungal tree of life, the majority of this uh, diversity you look at is uh, they form some form of interaction with uh, plants, either as mutualists or parasites, or they degrade it as saprotrophs. And I like this picture here because it really indicates how really they are often important to photos because here we have a plant and this is essentially the plant's root structure which is covered in a fungal um, uh, community of hyphal networks which is, enables this, fung uh, this plant to grow and function. Okay. So just before we go on to talk about marine fungi, I just want to hammer home a few more points, which is that essentially that uh, go, looking back at this idea of osmotrophy is what, fur, what further traits support osmotrophic function. And that's, as I mentioned earlier, the idea that they, they grow as polarized cells, so they form these long uh, filamentous structures, these, these um, uh, polarized cells, and as part of this, they often have these complex cytoskeletal systems that enable them to traffic proteins and cellular systems to the tip of, the, uh, of this hyphal thing. They have a robust cell wall, which is often chitin, uh, that enables them to armor their cell so that they can grow as these long hyphal structures, and they can tolerate um, and generate high turgor pressure within the cell. So basically, as they feed, they can flood the cytoplasm of the cell with lots of nutrients, and that nutrients generates high osmotic pressure, which is converted into turgor pressure, which means that they can ramify into material. And as a consequence of this, they have a very high metabolic rate. And this really is what underpins the success of fungi. That means that they can grow faster than their competitors. They grow, uh, ramify into material. It's also why they're such uh, powerful, invasive pathogens of both of mainly plants, but often animals. Um, so as kind of like emergent properties of the way fungi grow, they essentially grow as they feed. They can couple the act of growth with the act of feeding, which is, uh, which is kind of rare if you look at the other way microbes feed. They have to engage in what we call public goods interactions. So as they feed and process material outside the cell, other or microbe organ microbial organisms can access those nutrients and process them. So they essentially get, engage in public goods interactions. And as a consequence, as all these characteristics, they're often symbiotic. And I'm using the wider term, uh, term symbiosis here to mean both parasitic and mutualistic interactions. Okay. So as a consequence of all this, fungi dominate many ecosystems on land. And kind of to kind of emphasize this point, um, I like to use this, uh, this, uh, this statistic from O'Brien, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, who, who did use molecular approaches to estimate the total uh, diversity of fungal species in soil. And he did, uh, suggests there's between 3.5 and 5.1 million fungal species in soil. And independent of of, how, of what number you prefer, what this really demonstrates is there's a huge diversity of fungal species in, in terrestrial ecosystems, specifically soil. So now we turn to the main uh, topic of the lecture, which is what is the diversity and function of fungi in the oceans? Okay, okay so the first argument I want to make is, unsurprisingly, uh, marine fungi are undersampled. Okay, so um, uh, David Hawksworth, uh, in this uh, famous paper, uh, uh, um, summarized uh, uh, some data to predict uh, diversity, and he uh, records a, at that point there's about 100,000 fungal culture isolates. Okay, but interestingly, this review shortly after uh, said that only uh, of all the culture isolates they could search in... Uh, in um, in, in culture, culture collections, only 467 of those isolates come from marine environments. So that means that our actual knowledge of marine fungi is probably less than 0.5% of studied fungi. And what's slightly more worrying than the, the kind of low effort to sample fungi from the marine environment is that actually 
Uh, traditionally, fungi are, are sampled by culture media plates where you essentially isolate your fungus and grow it on an agar plate. But what's, it, um, what's interesting is that essentially selects against aquatic fungi because that's not their native habitat because they want to live in water. Uh, furthermore, as this data suggests, these, many of these aquatic fungi form interactions with other organisms, specifically photosynthetic algae. So they're essentially very difficult to recapitulate these kind of aquatic and marine fungi on a culture plate. So what I and many other people have argued is that what we're seeing here is a, a systematic bias in our understanding of marine fungi. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to change slightly and talk about uh, how... Um, how, how the marine ecosystem works. And of course, this is a horrendous generalization, but it's a nice review from a, a collaborator of mine, Alex Warden, um, who I'll talk a bit more about later. Essentially, this is how trophic networks function in the ocean. Essentially, you have photosynthetic algae that fix carbon. Uh, they're usually in the photic zone of the ocean, so the top layers of the ocean. They, they essentially then parasit uh, fed upon by heterotrophic protists, which are then fed upon by zooplankton and then fish. And during this process, you have uh, generation of fecal matter, which essentially passes down the water column to form uh, dissolved organic matter, or it gets spun up by vortexes into what we call marine snow or particulate orga uh, organic matter, which is what this is here. This is marine snow passing down the water column. Uh, uh, you also get uh, activity of viruses that destroy these algae that generate dissolved organic matter, which again feeds into this particular org organic matter. And this is such, such, I can't emphasize enough how important this system is for global function, global uh, um, biogeochemical function, because this is essentially what we call the carbon pump. When people talk about the ocean storing carbon long term, this is where it is stored. Okay, it's the, the collective function of the, this trophic network that drives uh, carbon being pushed into the deep oceans. Okay. okay, and just to really hammer home how profound the effect of these, these trophic interactions that all start with a pho photosynthetic organism. Here's a picture of the southwest of England. I live around here somewhere. And um, what you're seeing here from space is a uh, algal bloom off, uh, essentially off Plymouth. And um, uh, this is one eukaryote microbe. It's a relative of this organism here, which is a coccolithophore. And this uh, actually, when it's, fossilized, when it's fossilized, can become huge ge ge um, geological structures, such as the White Cliffs of Dover. And essentially, what you're seeing here is a huge, a huge bloom of, this, of one type of organism. Uh, essentially, you get other types of organisms, such as these diatoms here, which I'm going to talk about later. And, and these blooms are, are very profound for this global carbon network. Essentially, e e they drive large se sequestration of carbon into the deep oceans. Okay. So going back to this uh, nice figure from Alex, um, what she, this review says is it hammers home the point that essentially all of these interactions, are all of these stages of this trophic network are driven by interactions in the form of either symbiosis, uh, um, mixotrophy, or saprotrophy, or parasitism. And what, um, and also predation, so that's when one organism is eaten by a, a, another. So um, the question we're asking today is where are the fungi in the system? Where are fungal-like organisms that are so replete in terrestrial environments? Are they also in the ocean? So to get to this question, we, um, we use a slightly different method. We've kind of rejected the use of culture plate analysis. We use uh, environmental DNA-based methods. And this was a, a method uh, pioneered by Norman Pace. And he's holding up this poster of his colleague and friend, Carl Woos, who was famous because he essentially did the first molecular tree of life. And he based that using a small subunit, RNA encoding genes. He used them... He sequenced them from different microbes and used that to calculate the first tree of life. And Norman um, took this um, idea slightly further. And instead of culturing 
specific lineages of microbes and sequencing them, he would take a whole community, he would extract the DNA from that whole community, he would then target specific taxonomic defining regions, that's just illustrated by these shapes here, he would PCR them up, he would clone them into a, um, a vector which enabled him to sample systematically, one by one, each one of these um, uh, taxonomic identifying sequences. And then he could put that into phylogenetic analysis or do some community-based analysis, which is indicated by this graph here. So he invented this method, which has grown into a huge industry in its own right. And now we can use it to characterize microbial diversity in pretty much any ecosystem, any environmental sample. And there's been literally hundreds of these studies conducted on marine environments. And um, back uh, uh, five years ago now, uh, we started to put this data together into a phylogenetic tree to try and build a picture of what diversity of fungi is in the ocean. And uh, so here we are in the part of the tree, this part of the tree here, which is where Saccharomyces is, where the, the yeast is that we use to make wine. And this just illustrates these yellow uh, boxes here, just illustrate the type of fun, uh, fungi that are re related Saccharomyces that we consistently find in the ocean. Okay. Um, but what this study really revealed is that we can find a lot of fungi similar to the ones we find on the, in the terrestrial environment, such as the red and blue dots here. But we find a wide diversity of clusters of taxonomic units which are much more dissimilar from known sequences to, than, um, than, ones at, uh, than the known ones. So that's what this, this kind of spread here represents. And they tend to be branching in what people have called deeply derived fungi or lower branching fungi. And um, that's quite interesting because it suggests that the ocean contains this black box of deeply derived, fu uh, deep branching fungi that we don't really know what they look like, how they behave, or what they do. Okay. So... Uh, the criticism of this work is it's still not a real picture of marine fungal diversity. And that's for two main reasons. Sampling is not powerful enough, even though you can generate uh, up to uh, you know, thousands of sequences from clones. It's a, it's a kind of long-winded way of doing that. Uh, and um, furthermore, people have also argued that DNA is not an authentic signal of active and viable microbes. So it doesn't really tell us what true marine fungi is. So I'm going to explain a bit more what I mean about this not being an authentic signal shortly. So the question we came to about five, six years ago is how can we sample marine fungi in a more realistic way, in a more um, systematic way? And I just want to take you back to kind of uh, A-level type biology, and this is the central dogma, which is the idea that DNA is transcribed into RNA, and then that's translated into protein. And as you all probably know, DNA is an extremely stable molecule. That's why you can detect it freely in, in water, i.e. free of a cell. Uh, uh, so it can you mislead your sequence analysis. And also, um, uh, whereas RNA is generally thought of unstable. And to say it's unstable, you might think that's a negative thing, but it's actually a good thing because if you can detect an organism by RNA, it means it's probably actually a viable true organism. Uh, some people start to work on protein, but this depends on the protein you sequence, and it's actually much harder to sequence than RNA or DNA. So we made a decision that we were going to try and start looking at RNA. And um, what we did is went back to this method and essentially replaced this, um, this uh, uh, these steps here where you do the clone library sequence with a high throughput method which enables us to generate one to four orders magnitude more sequencing than using a clone library approach. And also, as part of this, we targeted both DNA and reverse transcribed RNA. So we're tar targeting an authentic mar marker for actual function um, of microbial cells. And we're very lucky enough to get funded some years back through this FP6, this European uh, uh, initiative, to, f um, uh, to do a, a large-scale analysis of multiple marine coastal sites across, uh, across Europe. So this is the Bay of Naples site that I mentioned um, earlier. And uh, uh, so we sampled Oslo, 
uh, Roscoff, Blaines, which is near Barcelona, Naples, and the, uh, Varna in the Black Sea. So these are all sites where we could sample material, we could extract both DNA and RNA, and we also did planktonic filtering for cell imaging, which is something I will talk about shortly. So uh, we set off uh, with the aim to use these new methods to try and characterize the diversity of microbial life that's, that's present in these environments. So uh, I'm not going to talk to you about the wider project today because it was quite a large project, which is a lot of uh, sequencing. But what I am going to talk to you about is our specific focus on fungi. And um, after doing this sequencing effort, we had 1,000, uh, sorry, what, nearly one and a half million clusters. So each cluster represents roughly a single taxonomic unit, a microbial taxonomic unit. Um, and of those one and a half million taxonomic units that we de detected across Europe, about 1,752 clusters are fungi or fungal-like. And that represents 10,000, nearly 11,000 sequencing reads. Okay. So uh, when we try and do some taxonomy on these sequences, you can see that depending whether you use the RNA-based molecules or the DNA, that actually the majority of them are these chytridiomycotes. So these are those fungi that form the swimming tails. These are what you would expect to be in an aquatic environment. There's some other, uh, the other major one are these kind of mystery fungi that we don't really know what they are. They just are assigned based on phylogenetic analysis with fungi, but we can't tell which group of fungi they branch with. So this suggests that the majority of the types of fungi we're detecting in the ocean form either these structures, these zoosporangia with these rhizoid structures that grow and feed off uh, material, or these kind of zoospores, which are essentially a reproductive cell that is, that is actually uh, ejected out of these zoosporangia. Okay. Uh, so as part of this work, we wanted to ask, ask the question, we wanted to take a second look at a diversity and abundance of fungi. So we said we've got our molecular sequencing data. Why don't we actually see if we can um, see some of these cells, just to give us an idea about how realistic that sequencing effort is. So what we did is we filtered the cells and asked the question, how many times can we see a chitin uh, cell-walled cell in, in the biomark sample? So these are examples of chitin cell walls. And here this... DAPI is a stain for DNA, so here you have a single cell, that's the nucleus, that's the mitochondria, and, that, and it's surrounded by a chitin cell wall. So that's a cell that has a, chi um, sorry, it has a chitin cell wall, so it's possibly a fungus. But you've got to remember what I said earlier, which is that chitin cell walls are not, an, are, um, are not a, you know, a definitive, hard definition of fungi. So the reason we wanted to do this is just compare the kind of abundance of chitin cell wall fungi, uh, putative fungi in the marine water column to that sequencing day. And as you can see from these numbers here, there's actually very few of these kind of typical fungal-like cell structures in the water column. And, uh, and just to give you some kind of comparator to this, a human breath only cont contains between 1 and 10 fungal spores. So that's a similar amount of um, spores as what you'd find in a milliliter of seawater. So to really test this, we, we got to use this fantastic ship in California. And now we're not doing coastal sites. We're going to open, open ocean. And we're also loading a half million pound flow cytometer onto this ship. And this is a joke that I borrowed from Alex, which is she asks herself, as it's being craned onto the ship, is it insured? Um, I, th I think it was. It still works. So we don't need to worry about that too much. Uh, so um, what we did is we went out into the ocean and asked the question, if we use a flow cytometer to sort out cells with a chitin cell wall, do we find like mist more fungi, more chitin cell wall fungi than we would have detect detected previously? And what we actually find is there's no significant difference from control uh, make, um, controls done. So this is consistent with the idea that there's very few of these classical cell walled fungi in the marine water column. Okay, and that's fine because the sequencing we're finding, as I mentioned earlier, is mainly these, these, uh, these chytridiomycota or these fungi that we're quite not sure where they quite assign in the tree of life. So they're consistent with this idea of a life cycle stage which doesn't tend to have a chitin cell wall. Okay, so what this is suggesting to me anyway is perhaps chytrids really are the dominant fungi in the water column. 
So that's the conclusion so far is very few chitin wool fungi in the marine water column samples. Okay, so this is a very complicated figure, which is just essentially a heat map of repeat sampled fungi in the biomass data set. So these are all the different phylotypes of fungi that we find multiple times in the marine water column. And I'm sorry that it's split up a bit, but what it essentially shows is that if, uh, this is if it's detected in both DNA and RNA, and this is the size fractions it's detected in, and these are the geographical location points. But the reason I show this mainly is to tell you that the vast majority of fungi that we detect in the ocean or, for, uh, or taxa that likes fungi are, are a branch in this one area here, this one clade here. Okay. And they're really interesting because they're a highly divergent phylogenetic group. They're not close to any previously known fungi, even kind of controversial fungal groups like the Cryptomycota or Roselida or the, um, or the Microsporidia. They look like something different from everything we've sampled previously. So we wanted to ask the question, what are these mystery fungal-like organisms doing in the ocean? So what we were able to do is make some fluorescently tagged probes. So these are short 23 base um, uh, nucleotides, which we attached a fluorescent marker to. And we can do some fancy uh, microscopy. And essentially, we can light up those, uh, those mystery fungi. And here they are. And what they, we find is essentially they are growing inside these diatoms here. So this, uh, these two types of diatom, which is Pseudonychia and Ketoceros. An interesting Pseudonychia is a, a cause of a toxic bloom. So what we think we're seeing is intracellular parasites of diatoms. And we also stain these with what we call calcofloor white, which is a stain for, uh, for chitin. So what this is again suggesting is these organisms are growing without chitin, which is consistent with our inability to detect chitin in the water column. So what we would argue is actually the kind of the dominant fungi or fungal-like organism that we are consistently detecting in the open water column are, are essentially intracellular parasites of diatoms. They don't have chitin cell walls that we can detect, and, they, and, they're, and they're present in diatom blooms. So potentially, they, these divergent fungal-like lineages can act as a parasitic factor which determines the fate of algal blooms. Okay. Okay. So I'm just showing you this picture again because the point I want to make is actually that the majority of the fungi we detected was in the sediment. Okay. And most of the stuff I've been talking about up to this was water column fungi. And the reason that we um, can't study sediment in the same way is you can't do microscopy in fed on sediment like you can do it on water column samples. So what we need to do now is we need to sample sediment to understand marine fungi. So how do we sample sediment? Well, you have to have some rich Americans that are willing to lend you this piece of equipment that was made in Britain. And um, uh, you have to go on a fancy ship, which has this neat moon pool, which you can launch this ROV out of, which is, is, is this is a large one. It's about the size of a small car. And uh, it takes several hours to get to the bottom of the ocean, and, um, and even more hours to get to come back up again. And what you can do is you can, if you befriend some friendly marine engineers, is you can develop systems that enable you to sample RNA in the deep sea. And actually, RNA is difficult to sample in the deep sea because if you go and get it from the deep sea, you sample it, and then it takes two hours to recover to the surface, and it undergoes huge changes in pressure. You've completely changed that microbial ecosystem. Okay. So, you, so working with the marine engineers, we developed this new system, which is this is a classic um, way of, uh, of sampling marine cores. And working with these engineers, they developed this new system, which has these five injector needles. And then you can load this, bl uh, this bladder here with buffer that preserves RNA. And then you can use it to inject into the sediment. And I'm going to show you how we did this. So this is at about 3,000 meters off the California coast. Did I show a picture? No. Off the California coast. And so here it is being pushed into the sediment. And what you can see, so it goes down the needles. You can just see the yellow tips here. So this, this bladder here is full of RNA preservative. And what you have here is we've loaded with fluorescein, which glows fluorescent under the lights of the ROV. So that's the robotic uh, um, machine uh, vehicle that we're using to sample. So you push it into the sediments, and then you squeeze it there, and it injects 
that RNA preservative into the sediment. Okay. So, just. And the great thing about fluorescein is that you can tell that you've got enough in because as you extract it, you can see that all the fluorescein is percolated up through the, th through the sediment in there. So we know this is saturated. And we did some experiments with microbees to investigate that saturation as well. And we were quite happy that it worked. Okay, so that, that was fun. I got to operate the cameras on that. I, they wouldn't let me operate the arm or the actual submarine. But um, <laughs> that was fun. So, Yes, well, yes. And uh, so we sampled these sites all around the Marine Canyon. We did do deeper ones, but actually we had a problem with the system failing as it came back. So we had to, we only got as deep as 957 meters. And we sampled, because uh, we want to do control experiments, both injected and non-injected samples. Okay. And before I tell you about the results of that data, I just want to tell you one thing about how we study microbial communities. Actually, you could apply this to pretty much any community ecology, which is the idea that if you look at the species in any community, then they form what people call a rare biosphere, which is actually the community is dominated by a few highly abundant species, and then you have a long chain of lots of rare organisms. Okay? And this is, so this is rank abundance against number of times detected. And actually, pretty much most or most uh, ecosystems are composed of this kind of diversity profile. Okay, so what we were interested in doing is seeing how injection versus non-injection in these communities, um, did it make a difference? Were we seeing any difference? And it's, sorry, it's a bit hard to tell on the screen, but actually if you look consistently, the green, which is always injected, is always higher than the purple. So that means that injection, you consistently recover more of the abundant organisms. Whereas because sequencing effort is not infinite, you uh, non-injected ones, you always consistently recover more of the rare ones. And what we think this means is that injection reveals a more realistic abundant versus rare community. So that actually, you can actually do better quantitative comparisons of rare versus abundant organisms in these ecosystems using injection. And that's statistically significant um, in nearly every case apart from this one here. Okay, so what does that mean? You just process this data further and what it shows you is, uh, I'm sorry the tree's so small, but there's no other way to show it because it's what we're detecting is a massive diversity of deep sea fungi. Huge diversity here. That tree represents in every branch on that node is essentially colored purple or red, which means it's a newly identified phylotype in the deep sea ecosystem, okay? And what we think this means that these organisms are performing a saprotrophic function. But what I also wanted to show you is that actually it's not just the fungi, which are known osmotrophic saprotrophs that we find in high diversity in this marine. It's other osmotrophic saprotrophs, such as these faustochytrids, which is another group that was once uh, um, uh, classified as fungi, but actually turns out to be on a different part of the tree and has convergently evolved fungal-like characters. Okay. So I'd just like to finish the talk by going back to uh, Julie, uh, Sir Huxley over here. Uh, and um, I want to make the... A lot of his life and work was like... Um, um, devoted to conservation and, and, nat and, and conserving natural ecosystems. And if I was to, I guess, maybe one thing I would tell him if I met him was that maybe interested to know that these are communities and ecosystems who we know almost nothing about. They're hugely underexplored, okay? But yet they're probably very important for oceanic biochemical cycles. This is where essentially carbon is converted from biological carbon into ge uh, geological carbon. Um, uh, uh, carbon. So it's long-term storage. So it, it basically stays there until we dri dig it up in the form of oil. Um, but what I'd probably tell them is there's increasing interest in human exploitation of these environments. So we're now actually in the, in the position where, and I can't think of many other environments where this is the case, where it's easier to mine these environments than study them. So I wonder... You know, if I was to tell him about a conservation thing that he should maybe pay a bit of attention to, it's probably 
as, as, a, as, a, as occupiers of this planet, perhaps we should think about how we allow ourselves to utilize these resources. And just show this picture, which was taken in Mbari, of a beer can from the 70s that they found in the deep ocean. And um, finally, I'd just like to thank my collaborators, Alex Warden, who's at Mbari in California. She's a great collaborator. Uh, uh, um, Nick Tolbert, who I, we talk a lot about what is a fungi and how parasitic characters evolve in fungi. He's also a fantastic mentor. And um, Ramon Masana, who's a long-term collaborator, who we started to work together in Biomarks, but he's, um, we, we do lots of projects together. He's probably not being a scientist now. He's probably uh, protesting on the streets of Barcelona at this moment, try, trying to free the people. That's what he would say, anyway. Uh, and my uh, research group um, who work on this, uh, uh, the red ones have all contributed towards this, and Estelle, who sat there, also contribute towards this work. And this is our funders. Uh, originally, the work was started by this European grant. I'm slightly sad that that might not be the case in a year's time, that UK scientists will miss out on these great um, collaborations. And then uh, um, most of our work now is in this area is funded by the Moore Foundation. And thank you for listening. <laughs>